Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. On our 934th day together in the Word of God, we're back in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 8. Let's pray. Father in heaven, please give us grace by your Holy Spirit to understand your Word. Give us understanding, give us faith, write it on our hearts. Help us respond to your word with faith and obedience to honor you for how great you are and what you speak to us in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 8. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures and the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers, and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water, because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard an angel crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets, that the three angels are about to blow. That's Revelation chapter 8. Now we saw, I think pretty clearly, at the end of Revelation 6, that with the sixth seal, it was the great day of the wrath of the Lamb. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and every mountain and island was removed from its place, and the sun was darkened and the moon became blood and all the stars were removed out of their place. It it was the end. It was the catastrophic great day of the Lord. And now there's a seventh seal and the seventh seal brings silence. And in many ways, it brings this, this summary of the judgment, even as it introduces the next series of seven, that is the seven trumpets. There is a recapitulation or we might also call it progressive parallelism, in that we're being shown in Revelation a peek behind the curtain, a glimpse of heaven. We're we're shown letters to seven churches about the way that the church lives during the church age, the kinds of churches there are, ones that are faithful, ones that are loveless but theologically correct, ones that have a weak witness, ones that are corrupt, and sexually immoral ones that teach false doctrine. We're given a a, a variety of these kinds of churches in the seven churches. We see a sevenfold praise of God in heaven for creation and for redemption, and we're told that the Lamb is worthy with a sevenfold doxology. And then we're given seven seals that the Lamb is worthy to open, and they pour out judgment that primarily comes in the form of conquest. Conquering kings go out to conquer, and when they do, they bring war and famine and death. The the martyrs, many of whom are killed by these conquering kings, these 
megalomaniacal world rulers who, who persecute believers. We could think of Mao Zedong or uh, Joseph Stalin or Pol Pot, or we could think of Emperor Nero uh, who killed some of the apostles, or we could think of other Roman emperors who, you know, did horrible things to martyr God's people. The, it's the rulers who, who are responsible for those martyrs. But now we're seeing a different series of seven, the seven trumpets. And the seventh seal is the transition from the seal judgments to the trumpet judgments. And this silence in heaven for about a half an hour shows us something that we actually saw earlier with the martyrs. Remember the martyrs lifted up the prayers? Actually, go back, sorry, go back to chapter 5. Here, I'll just do it. We'll go back to Revelation chapter 5, where we saw that the, the 24 elders who were around the throne in Revelation 5, 8, what do they have? They have golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And it is from the Lamb and from the throne that the four horsemen are are sent out as the Lamb is opening the seals. It's a voice from the four living creatures, from, from the throne of God, that the four horsemen are, are sent out. And so in response to the prayers of God's people, we see those prayers reflected in the, the souls of the martyrs who are under the altar before the throne of God, crying out, how long, how long? And we see that the prayers of God's people are what bring the judgment of God onto the world. We see that same theme repeated here at the beginning of Revelation chapter 8. Look at verses 4 and 5. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth, threw it down on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. That, that um, description at the end of verse 5 series of words, peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. This is a description of the judgment of God, ultimately of the final judgment day. But as Romans 1 tells us, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all of the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who in their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is being revealed. And in many ways, what Revelation is teaching us is that the wrath of God is revealed in response to the prayers of God's people. As God's people suffer persecution, as God's people suffer rejection, they cry out to the Lord, Lord, see, hear, how long, act, arise, O Lord. Many of the Psalms give us language to pray when we're being persecuted. Yesterday, in church, if you go to Forest Hill or you want to look at the sermon online, yesterday in church we had the sermon from Psalm 17, which was David crying out for God to act in to defend him from those who were wrongly attacking him. We see the same thing happen here. So the prayers go up and the judgment comes down. And the judgment here in Revelation 8, the trumpet judgments are judgments on the natural order on creation itself. Chapter 6, the seal judgments are judgments that come primarily in the, we could say, in the realm of human activity with conquerors going out to conquer, making war, famine, and death. Here, it's the creation itself that's cursed and cursed greatly. Now, we can see this happen in the world in two different ways. One, human sin causes the destruction and corruption of the natural world. Human sin pollutes, stains, trashes God's good creation. So in the pursuit of power, in the pursuit of pleasure, in the pursuit of affluence, we destroy creation. We clear-cut rainforest. We fill the oceans with plastic garbage. Uh, we fill the skies with air pollution. We, we pollute the rivers uh, with, with water pollution. 
that happens. But also there are natural disasters. There are volcanoes, there are earthquakes, there are hurricanes, there are tornadoes, mudslides, wildfires that choke out, that, that curse creation. And that's really the picture we have here in Revelation chapter 8 is the first angel, the first trumpet is fire and hail mixed with blood thrown upon the earth, a third of the earth burned up. So these are these are land curses, okay? And the second is on the seas, curses that are thrown into the sea and the sea being cursed. The third angel, springs of water, that's fresh water, being made undrinkable. And then the fourth angel, you have even the skies, even the, the cosmos suffering. These are judgments of God. Now, I'm going to say something controversial here, and I want you to be very careful and hear me for what I'm saying and what I'm not saying, right? Some Christians have made it almost an article of faith that we as Christians don't believe in man-made global warming or in man-made climate change, as if human sin doesn't destroy, mar God's creation. As if we couldn't see rising global temperatures and rising sea levels and a threat to the humanity that lives along the seacoast and low-lying areas, we could not see that as a result of human activity. And sometimes they appeal to scripture and say how God's going to preserve his creation. But here in Revelation 8, we see that God actually curses his creation because of the sin of man. And this actually is a theme that goes all the way back to the original curse that's put on creation because of Adam's sin in Genesis 3. And it's a theme again and again. When Sodom and Gomorrah are judged by God, it's it's a disaster as fire and sulfur are rained down from heaven. And these this whole valley that was once fertile, so fertile, remember that, um, that Laban wanted to go there because it seemed like the most fertile valley. And then it was just destroyed in a disaster. We, we see that throughout history, God has used volcanoes and God has used wildfires, but God has also used human activity, pollution, destruction, to lay waste his, his creation. Now, there's a limit to it. It's always a limit, no more than a third, no more than a third. God does preserve the basic integrity of his creation until Jesus comes again. I don't think we're going to see a point where all human life on earth is wiped out. Some sort of apocalypse that our culture likes to talk about, an environmental disaster apocalypse that's going to make the earth entirely uninhabitable because God preserves. There's a limit. It's a third, only a third, which means two thirds. Now, that's not literal. None of the numbers in Revelation are literal numbers. This is apocalyptic literature. It's symbolic. And what it means is God will limit the amount of damage that is allowed to be done. And I do believe it corresponds, this one-third in Revelation 8, I do believe it corresponds with the fact that a third, one-third of the heavenly hosts of the angelic beings fell with Satan in his rebellion, which we'll see later when we get to that part of Revelation. His tail swept a third of the stars from the heavens when he rebelled against God. But God does curse creation. Now, in our modern American evangelical mindset, I don't think we're very comfortable for that, with this. I don't think we have categories for this. We don't, we don't like thinking about God as a God of wrath and a God of curse and a God of judgment. Like, we all know that's going to happen when Jesus comes again. At least we're supposed to. So I think a lot of people take a futurist approach to Revelation because it kind of pushes off this ugly stuff into the distant future or you know, maybe not so distant future, we don't know, but it's sometime in the future. It's not something we're dealing with right now. But Romans 1 already tells us in Romans 1.18 that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. God is pouring out his wrath now. Read Romans 1.18 to the end and you'll see patterns of idolatry, patterns of immorality are the judgment of God upon creation. And here we see that patterns of warfare and conquest and famine and death, patterns of natural disaster and the destruction of the natural environment are also the wrath of God upon human beings. So this is what the Bible teaches. And we need to take it seriously. We need to realize that 
There's no random accidents. And if we think, well, I thought God is good and I thought God is merciful. God is God good. God is merciful. He sets a limit of a third. He sets a limit to say the majority of his creation is preserved. The whole world is not burning up. It's not. The whole world's not covered with disaster. It's not. But there are very real disasters. There are times when wildfires destroy hundreds of square miles and, and destroy people's homes. There are times when hurricanes wipe out communities. There are times when mudslides bury thousands of people. There are times when earthquakes destroy whole cities. Tsunamis wipe out coastal cities. That is the judgment of God that comes with the curse of creation. And it's also true when rivers are so jammed full of plastic and garbage that they're undrinkable. It's also true when whole rainforests are just clear-cut affecting global climate patterns. That's also part of the judgment of God on creation for human sin. And we need to hear the word of God, and we need to be willing to speak the truth to the world, be willing to think biblically in our own approach to the world. Not politically, not in an earthly way, but in a biblical, Christ-centered worldview. So Revelation 8, I believe, challenges us to realize that God's judgment is a present and future reality. It's present now, limited. It's coming totally. We need to believe that. We need to share that with others as appropriate. And we need to live as if God is the sovereign one. This is all coming from his throne. And so we need to believe it. I think it also shapes our prayer life some. Because it's in response to the prayers of God's people that these judgments come. So to pray imprecatory prayers for the downfall of wicked rulers who oppress God's people. I think that's appropriate. I think it's appropriate to say there are men of wickedness and bloodshed in the world who oppress God's people and to pray, Lord, remove them from their position of power so that your people are not persecuted anymore. Judge them for their evil. Imprecatory prayers from the Psalms are still appropriate. And we see evidence of that here in Revelation chapter 8. So let's live as biblically minded people, not as, you know, mushy, squishy Jesus you know, who, who is just meek and mild. He is meek and mild. He is tender and merciful. He is gracious. And I'm so thankful for that. But he's also sovereign and holy. And he's also the judge of the whole world, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to believe what your word says. Help us to live in the light of your word. We have so many voices talking to us all the time telling us all sorts of things that are often half-baked truths or incomplete messages or things that just are not accurate to what your word says. Help us to be biblically minded, discerning, that we might pray faithfully, that we might worship rightly, and that we might live and witness faithfully. We pray these things, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that is Revelation chapter 8. Thanks for joining me for that. Tomorrow, we are going back to the prophet Jeremiah. I hope you have a blessed day in the Lord. Mm -hmm.